start. Yep. So let us start with the uh, last session. Okay, so <clears throat> I'll start uh, by uh, talking more about uh, modular space of stable supercurves and uh, the identification of the canonical bundle, or in other words, the kind of Mumford isomorphism over it, uh, especially what happens at the boundary. And then, if time allows, I'll also say about some computations in low genus. Okay, so first of all, what goes into the construction, into the kind of uh, proof of this theorem I mentioned last time that uh, we have this nice uh, sm smooth and proper orbifold of, uh, of uh, stable supercurves. So this is a smooth proper. Uh, or default. So this is uh, kind of stable super curves. So the genus here is the genus of the underlying curve. So what goes into the proof? So one major ingredient in the proof is uh, deformation theory. Kind of based on deformation theory. And there are two parts to deformation theory. There is uh, some local deformation theory of, of nodal things, or kind of, of super nodes of nodal singularities. And there is a global deformation theory. So first of all, one needs to understand deformation of the nodes. So when we consider deformations of the super curves or of the node, we always mean deformations together with the super conformal structure. So together with this structure distribution or structure de de uh, de derivation. Right, so the first First result is indeed the description of the universal deformations of uh, the nodes of two times types, so of Neva Schwartz and Ramon nodes. So this was actually uh, the ingredient that, that was explained uh, in the original letter of Delin, where he kind of sketched this construction. So, so the Ramon case is a little easier. So because it's a little bit like uh, like the description of deformation in the even case. So in the even case, when you just uh, kind of just to remind you, so when you consider uh, this nodal singularity, the, the universal deformation is so that you just, you just write x, y equals t. So it means if you have any uh, deformation of the singularity, it is actually induced by this one parameter deformation. So there is a map of the base of deformation to the uh, formal disk such that, or rather, yeah, we're talking about formal deformations, right? Such that it's actually induced by this one. So, so this is the deformation. And in the Ramon case, it's kind of of the same type. We just add uh, a node variable. So the universal deformation will be, uh, so described by three variables, x, y, theta, where these are even and this one is odd. And uh, just single equation, x, y equals zero. And uh, sorry, this is the node itself. And then uh, the deformation 
is going to have one parameter, which is even parameter, one even parameter. And uh, so nothing happens. So with, with the odd variable, we still have x, y, theta. And uh, the structure derivation is given by some standard formula. So there is a, in this case, the Uh, dualizing shift is uh, locally free, so it has one generator. So generator, I'll call it B, so it's given by, so it's associated with the basis uh, dx over x d theta on, on the open where x is not zero and with dy over minus dy over y d theta, where y is not zero, so it kind of glues into global generator, and the, st the uh, structure derivation is given uh, by, uh, by this odd differentiation, odd derivation, which is, uh, so let's call this u1 and this one u2. So it's given by d uh, theta plus theta uh, x dx on u1 and by d theta plus theta y dy on u2. <coughs> so universal deformation means that uh, any other deformation is induced by this one and it, in, it, it is actually minimal in some sense. So it induces an isomorphism on tangent spaces to deformation functor. So there, there doesn't exist a universal deformation. So universal deformation would mean that any other deformation is induced by the unique map to the base of this deformation and uniqueness is not satisfied because of automorphisms. So this is always uh, like this in modular theory. When you deform objects which have automorphisms, you cannot hope to have kind of a universal solution. So you can only have kind of, you can, that's kind of the reason we get stacks uh, or orbifolds rather than genuine spaces. Right, so the universal deformation of the Neville Schwartz node is a little more complicated. So I'll call the variables z1, z2, theta1, theta2. Okay, so again, this was the node itself. This is, uh, this is the deformation. This is deformation. Well, in fact, it's actually defined over a fine line with variable t, t but we're actually just interested in the corresponding formal family. So in the Schwartz node, so the Node itself looks like this, so we just have equations that all these products are zero. And then we have a deformation also over A1. So still with the same variables. Uh, but now the equations will look like this. So there will be again one parameter of the deformation T. Uh, you'll have Z1 theta 2 equals T theta 1, Z2 theta 1 equals T theta 2, and theta 1 theta 2 is still zero. And the structure derivation is given uh, by so delta of f equals to uh, so again there are two two opens where z1 is not zero and z2 is not zero and it's given on each of them by standard formula So this is on the open where zi is not zero, where i is either one or two. Now this is 
a seemingly simple result, but it is a result of kind of the most complicated computation <laughs> in, 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 in Berlin's paper, or rather in his letter, because what happens that if you just consider deformation of this as a super scheme, there are more, a lot more parameters, and it is precisely the condition that the superconformal structures preserves that only leaves one even parameter. Otherwise, you might have some odd parameters. So there is actually kind of complicated uh, calculation where you first calculate all deformations and then inside the space of all deformations as super scheme, you find this uh, line corresponding to superconformal deformations. Okay, uh, right, another ingredient in deformation theory is uh, that you need to know something about global deformations. So in other words, about deformations of super curves with uh, the nodes. And uh, so first uh, I need to say uh, something about deformations of uh, smooth super curves. So, so two deformations of smooth super curves. <coughs> right, so here, uh, uh, as in the case of, vari of usual varieties, we know that deformations are controlled by the tangent shift. So you take, uh, so here, instead of vector fields, which are in kind of infinitesimal symmetries of the variety, we need to consider, so when we have a super curve, uh, so over a point, so without family, right? So smooth super curve. Then uh, you need to consider uh, inside of all vector fields, you need to consider vector fields which preserve the uh, di structure distribution. We will call them TSC, which means superconformal. So these are superconformal vector fields. And by definition, this, uh, so these are vector fields such that uh, if you take commutator, so remember that we have a structure distribution uh, of rank zero one. And so the commutator with v, with v should preserve the structure distribution. Okay, so if you think, you can always think of a vector field as a automorphism of the product of X with the dual numbers, and it would be kind of either even or odd, depending on whether this is even or odd vector field, and the condition is that this automorphism preserves the structure distribution. Now, <coughs> here there is a major difference uh, so this is a technicality, but there is kind of uh, an obvious difference from the uh, th even theory when you consider the usual modular spaces of varieties or of, for example, curves, in that Tx is a vector bundle, so it's a coherent shift. You can multiply vector fields by functions. Superconformal vector fields is not a coherent shift because this condition is not preserved when you multiply a vector field by a function. And this, is, this sounds like a complication, but uh, we are kind of in luck because there is a canonical isomorphism of this shift with certain coherent shift, in fact, with, with a vector bundle. And that helps in global theory because you need to know vanishing of some cohomology. And vanishing of cohomology is easier to prove for coherent shifts than for arbitrary shifts. So there is an important lemma for, that for smooth super curves, if you consider superconformal vector fields, so they are embedded into all vector fields, and then you can project to quotient by the structure distribution. And this map is an isomorphism of shifts. And this is good for us because 
This guy on the right is already a coherent sheaf, and this also works in families, right? So remember, this, this is the same thing as the uh, omega x to the minus 2, and this also works in families. So this is a little compute. This is actually a nice computation. I can briefly indicate how it works. So remember, so we pick standard coordinates. So here is the proof. So in standard uh, coordinates <coughs> z theta, we know that the distribution is generated <coughs> by the single odd vector field d given by d theta plus theta dz. And then, uh, be, so the property of being super conformal, you can just write as a certain equation. So we can write any vector field um, uniquely. So, so yeah, the point is that uh, uh, this pair of vector fields, this is a basis This is a local basis of, of the tangent shift, right? So this is uh, even, this is odd, so this is rank 1-1. One, one. So it's very easy to see that this is a basis. So you can write any vector field. You can write uniquely as some function times dz plus some function times d. So if you write it in this form, then you can write the equation for this to be super conformal. So this is super conformal if and only if B is determined by A. So this is minus one to uh, the degree plus minus, so it's plus minus one D of A. So you see that V is uniquely determined by A. And this is A times DZ, this is exactly projection modular, modular the structure distribution. So that's the proof of the lemma. Right, and uh, so this is kind of main, uh, yeah, so in general, if, uh, if you have any stable super curve, uh, so you can use, you can construct uh, a sheaf of infinitesimal uh, automorphism, so it's a sub sheaf in T, in, in the, well, so, because it's not smooth, so tangent sheaf is not a, b a vector bundle, it's just a sheaf of all derivations uh, of OX. And in there we have a sheaf of infinitesimal automorphisms. So, these are derivations which preserve the, uh, which are compatible with the structure of a supercurve, with a superconformal structure. And then, uh, so we have an important property that there are no infinitesimal deformations. This is kind of stability, what stability is about. And secondly, um, when we kind of study the tangent space to the deformation, well, we can study kind of deformation factor of X versus deformations of the nodes in X. So. So suppose this has like uh, with nodes Q1 through QK. So then we have a kind of natural transformation of functors from deformation functor of X. We have a map to uh, product of, deforma of deformation spaces for each of the nodes. Uh, 
And so this uh, kind of uh, one can prove that this is a smooth map of deformation functors. Uh, and uh, on level of tangent spaces, we have, so if we consider tangent space to deformate, so these are truly infinitesimal deformations where you just deform with a parameter epsilon, which is squares to zero, either even or odd. So when you consider infinitesimal deformations, you have exact sequence of uh, tangent spaces. So here you'll have tangent space to deformation of each node, and these are all one dimensional and even. So each of these is even copy of, of a line. And the kernel of this, these are locally trivial deformations. So this sheaf of infinitesimal automorphisms, as for any geometric structure H1 with coefficients in sheaf of infinitesimal automorphisms, these are locally trivial deformations of your geometric structure. So the the deformations of a super curve that are trivial, are locally trivial exactly when they induce trivial deformations of the node. And this kind of helps you, for example, to calculate dimensions. So from this you can, uh, you can easily identify what is this uh, shift in terms of, uh, in terms of the underlying curve and the spin structure. And this uh, allows you to calculate the dimension of, uh, of the modular space, the even and the odd dimensions. Right, so... Uh, yeah, probably I'll skip this part. So, but uh, you actually get uh, the dimensions already, uh, the formulas for dimensions you already get by considering smooth supercurves, but you need all this to kind of to prove that your uh, modular space is smooth. You need to consider every stable supercurve, so cur curve, and you need to check that everything is smooth near uh, uh, every stable supercurve. And here, kind of the major, uh, I, uh, the, the main idea is actually the same as in the case of modular space of curves. So why do you, how do you know that the modular spaces of curves is smooth? It's because H2 on the curve is zero and usually a kind of abstractions for extending a deformation with, when you have some extension with nilpotence is, lies in H2. And H2 of coherent shifts in dimension one is zero. So here, this lemma, because it identifies the shift of tangent of, of super conformal vector fields with something coherent, and because the underlying bosonic space is still one dimensional, we again have the vanishing of H2, and that's kind of the reason why we have smoothness. Okay, so, uh, right, so other than that, uh, what are the ingredients? Yeah, so I already explained that smoothness follows from deformation theory. Properness follows from the corresponding problem, classical problem about super curve, about usual curves with spin structures. And uh, yeah, so you also use uh, uh, the Hilbert schemes to prove some technical uh, results on representability of isomorphism. Uh, spaces, yeah, so that's basically what goes into the proof of the modulus, that the modulus space forms, um, forms a nice, uh, <coughs> a nice modulus stack. So here is one more, one more interesting uh, uh, result. So this, uh, Infinite, shift of infinitesimal, infinitesimal automorphisms, actually it plays an important role in our further analysis because it replaces the tangent, tan tangent uh, bundle in the Kadaira spencer isomorphism. So eventually we want to understand uh, the top forms, top holomorphic forms on our moduli space. So to understand the top forms, you first need to understand the tangent bundle 
And to understand the tangent bundle, the, you need, so there, there is this uh, kind of analog of code error Spencer isomorphism. And here there is, um, so the, 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 what you basically need is you need to extend this isomorphism to the case of a family, to the case of degener degenerating family, where not all fibers are smooth. Okay, so, so we need to kind of need to gen uh, generalize this isomorphism AX with omega X to the minus, minus two to families of super curves. Okay, so here we need, uh, so this is not going to be possible for all families, so we are, I'm uh, restricting to some families which I call good families. So a good family of supercurve, or I maybe just, just uh, good relative supercurve x over s. Uh, so this is such super curve that every node kind of gets uh, unraveled into, into its, um, gets smoothened out in this family. So th this, that's kind of informally what it means. Formally we need that for every node in, a fi in any fiber over some S, the corresponding map from S to deformations of this node should be a smooth uh, map. Okay, so informally it means that every node gets smoothened in this family. Smoothed out. So for example, it will not be true if you just can take a family which consists only of stable curves where kind of some node persists throughout the family. So, but it will be true for the universal family. So that's kind of the main example where we can apply this. So now the theorem is the following. So consider for such a family, consider an open subspace, op consider just the smooth locus of this family. So this is, complement to all the nodes and all fibers. Okay, so then U over S is a smooth super curve, right? So, so for generic fiber, U is just the whole fiber. Generic fiber is smooth, so you don't do anything. But then there is a co-dimension lo one locus in the base where you throw away some points in the fiber. So, so you're actually throwing away something of co-dimension two in X, right? Because it's, it's kind of, of it's, something happens only over co-dimension one in the base and then in each fiber over this locus you throw away some finitely many points. So then the claim is that, uh, okay, so U over S is smooth. This is a smooth super curve. And then the claim is that uh, so you take, uh, if you take the corresponding relative Berezinian of this family of super curves U over S, so this is a line bundle on U, so you take its second power and then you take push, shift theoretic push forward to X. Then the claim is that you actually get a line bundle on X, so this is locally free. So it's locally free, so it's a line bundle. On X. Or yeah, it could be any even degree here, plus minus one, or I mean plus minus two, or you know, for any K. So in particular, we will use it for, my, for the for power minus two, because uh, that's the one that gives the uh, sheaf of infinitesimal deformations. 
that is crucial, but that's not on the only reason. So, because if you just take odd power, then it's not true. You see, this is still line bundle for odd powers. Yeah, this, this, this is something that kind of, so if you did it in purely even case, uh, there would be no problem. But here, actually, there is a different behavior near Niver Schwartz and near, near Ramon nodes. So near Ramon nodes, you don't need even power. Any power would, would extend to, to a line bundle. But near Niver Schwartz, it's only going to be true for even powers. <coughs> Yeah, this is a local result, and uh, I can explain it in the following way. So, so right, so near Ramon node, uh, we already get that uh, omega xs is locally free. And so, and uh, so G star of omega to any power is just uh, power of the of this line bundle. So near a month node, there is kind of nothing interesting going on. Now near a near Schwartz node, um, so the. Yeah, so kind of in terms of <coughs> in terms of these variables, z z one, z two, z one, z two. So if if you kind of remember the general this, um, so you can think uh, uh, if you look at this family, you can think of the odd part of this family as a module over the even part. So the even part would be this singularity z one, z two equals t square. And then you can think of theta 1, theta 2 as generators of a module over this. Uh, and uh, yeah, this module is given by some relation, and it's clear that it's not locally free. You need two generators, theta 1, theta 2. But mm, remarkably, if you take mm, tensor square of this module kind of away from the singularity and, and extent, you just get a line bundle. And, so roughly speaking, it's because of the following fact. So locally, we can choose, we can uh, reduce, so yeah, near Niva Schwartz node. So we can assume that we can reduce to the case uh, when the, uh, just to the case of this universal family, to the case of when the base is this A1 and we have the standard family. So then, uh, so then we can just uh, think in terms of even and odd components. So when we look at the um, uh, at this uh, relative uh, dualizing shift, so it has it has even and odd components. Right, but it's uh, generated by so it's, it's generated in, in degree one, and that's the problem why it, why it fails to be locally free because this L, when you view it over the entire family, it actually fails to be locally trivial, right? But when you square, when you take tensor square, it, it over U though it is still a line bundle and therefore it is a generator. But when you when you tensor square it, so you will just get uh, kind of, it, it's going to be generated by L square, so it will be L square plus L uh, tensor omega C. And, yes, yeah, still generated over U, but that's the same thing as just uh, uh, kind of omega C tensor uh, o plus O C plus L. But uh, this part, this is just the structure shift of, of the underlying curve X. And so we see that this actually becomes locally free module because omega C is locally free. 
for the underlying curve, uh, yeah, this is over S. <coughs> so we just use the fact that the for, for family of usual, uh, for the family of the usual uh, nodal curves, the <coughs> uh, relative uh, dualizing shift is locally free. Right, in fact, this, uh, yeah, this one extra interesting result here is that this uh, omega, yeah, so I will denote, I will denote this shift as uh, omega x s to the power 2k, so <coughs> uh, this will be a line bundle on x. Okay, and this actually plays a role in the Kodaira Spencer map. So let me quickly recall for you the, what is the Kodaira Spencer map for the usual. Uh, yeah, so now we're, I'm kind of starting to explain the Mumford isomorphism. So the first ingredient in Mumford isomorphism is the Kodaira Spencer map. So first, let me recall you what it is for usual for family of uh, usual stable curves. So suppose you have a family of stable curves, which is kind of also good in the same family, in the same sense as before, that every node gets uh, smoothed out in this family. So here you have a divisor where uh, you get nodes. So this is divisor of nodal curves. And uh, so there is its pre-image. Let's call this map pi. Um, so then you consider, <coughs> so to describe, uh, to describe the, uh, tangent kind of, uh, so we want, we want somehow to describe the tangent, bu tangent bundle to the universal family, right? So, and if, 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 if you have any family, we will, we will get some, uh, so we want, to, we want to describe a map from uh, kind of certain cohomology in fibers of pi, of certain sheaf and fibers of pi. So namely, mm, yeah, so, so let's, let's denote by T S S naught. So this will be a, a vector fields on the base which preserve the divisor S naught. So, so let me assume actually that this divisor, I'm con I'll consider just local situation. Let's assume that this divisor is given by equation T equals zero. So it's Let's assume that the base is smooth and we have this smooth divisor in this base given by one single equation. So then this consists of vector fields uh, which preserve the ideal generated by T. So in other words, V of T over T is regular. Right, so in other words, if you, if you fix uh, coordinates on the base such that T is one of the coordinates, then uh, this uh, bundles preserving this divisor, so they will, this, will, this will also be a bundle of the same rank, so it will have a basis, so this is kind of coordinates on S. So then the basis of this, <coughs> of this bundle will be so you have all vector fields which have nothing to do with uh, T, and then you take T times DT. Okay, so you just multiply the uh, DT by T, and then th this condition is satisfied. It preserves the, the divisor T equals zero. So this is the basis of, of, this, vec of this bundle TSS naught. So somehow in the, in the code I Spencer of 
smooth varieties, we, we deal with the bundle of all vector fields on the base, but whenever you have this nodal singularities, you, you need to consider instead kind of this, uh, this bundle preserving the nodal divisor. And uh, so the Kodaira Spencer map is going to be uh, so a canonical map from this shift to fiberwise cohomology of um, relative tangent shift of this family. Uh, okay, maybe I'll write it in this form of omega C over S inverse. So this is a line bundle uh, inverse of the inverse of the relative canonical bundle of the family. So it is constructed using the following exact sequence. So it comes as a connecting homomorphism from exact sequence of shifts on C zero T C S T C C naught and here we have pi star of T S S naught uh, so here we consider vector fields preserving the divisor C naught, and these are vector fields uh, which are trivial. So these are derivations of C on C, which preserve, which kill the functions pulled back from uh, from the base. And this is canon. This is actually isomorphic to. So T C S is nature isomorphic to omega C S inverse for good families. Right, so when you consider push forward of this to, to the base, so you will get the connecting homomorphism from push forward of this to R1 P star of this, and that will induce the Kodaira Spencer map. Okay, now for what happens for supercurves? For good, for good family of super curves. So, could there a Spencer map for good super curve? So again, we have uh, a divisor here of, so I assume that we have this um, uh, divisor of nodal supercurves. So away from it, there, this is going to be smooth. And uh, so then we have an analog of this sequence, which looks like this. So it's going to be this, uh, Chief of infinitesimal deformations. Then here, this will be a kind of shift of uh, vector fields on, so these are vector fields uh, on X, such that they preserve the distribution over the smooth locus. And in addition, they preserve they preserve the divisor uh, T, so V of T over T is regular. And then here we have pi inverse of T S S naught. And then this is the end of the sequence. And so these are V in T X, which preserve the derivation over smooth locus, the, the distribution over smooth locus. And such that V of OS is zero. Yeah, and uh, so 
the analog of this isomorphism of the relative of, the, of this subshift with omega inverse. So now it will use this uh, fact that I proved that uh, we have this line bundle omega to the minus two. So, so this is, uh, we, we know this on the smooth locus. Okay, and then, uh, so we, we proved this on the smooth locus. So, on this, so away from the nodes, this is the same as superconformal vector fields. And I explained that the projection modular distribution gives an isomorphism of this with this. And then the point is that you just take this isomorphism over the smooth locus, and then you apply this uh, functor of extension J star. And here, by definition, you get this line bundle. And uh, it's easy to see that this one is uh, obtained uh, as J lower star of, its history of, of the superconforming vector fields using the fact that codimension is of dimension two. The, the complement is of codimension two. Okay, and from this we get a uh, codire Spencer map. So get code error Spencer map from T S S naught to R1 pi star omega x over S to the minus two, and it becomes so theorem is this this becomes this becomes an isomorphism for universal family. And uh, yeah, and in fact, so we, we, we then, uh, so to, to comp so this allows us to compute, uh, so from here we can compute in some terms, we can compute the uh, Berezinian of, uh, of the modular space. Well, just the, Omega S G bar, which is by definition Berezinian of uh, Omega one S G bar. So because uh, you can you can sort of compare this, this. This is not the same as tangent bundle to S, but you can you can uh, kind of you can s measure the difference between these two bundles very easily because remember this guy just has an extra T with D T. So it means that, uh, uh, so when, when you consider the natural map from T S, S naught to T S, so this is a map of vector bundles which is generically an isomorphism. And so there is one direction that gets rescaled by T. So it means that if you write it in terms of matrices, as, as kind of mat matrix of this linear transformation, it will look like all ones, and then there will be T at one spot. Okay, and one, and, and this means that when you take a Berezinian of this, so the Berezinian of this will be, the induced map between the Berezinians will be multiplication by this equation T. Okay, and uh, so this means that you can actually express Berezi the difference between the Berezinians of this in terms of the divisor which gives you, the, in terms of the boundary divisor, the equation of the boundary divisor. So, um, right, so from this we get the following theorem. So, I will make a stop then after formulating this theorem. So we get the following theorem that uh, the 
so the bundle of uh, the Berezinian bundle of the module of super stable super curves is the same thing as the uh, this bundle B of associated with O X of so I take universal family for the bundle of uh, for the for the module of sub stable super curves I take this uh, deter kind of Berezinian construction so this by definition is uh, remember this is uh, Berezinian of the complex R P star And then, uh, and then we twist it by Cartier divisor. So, so this is a boundary divisor. So the interesting thing here is that unlike in the classical case of usual curves, we have nilpotence. So when we have a, something of codimension one, it does not have a canonical equation because uh, so canonical equation exists on reduced spaces on spaces with nil, without nilpotence you can sort of take the minimal equation here there is no such thing so you can actually have to define uh, a system of local equations which differ by invertible elements so you need to define the structure of Cartier divisor as we say so, and this structure is indeed, is this, it has a natural definition, and, and then this isomorphism holds. So this is not yet Mumford isomorphism, this is half of Mumford isomorphism. The other half is expressing, oops, sorry, I forgot minus two here. Uh, so the other half of Mumford isomorphism is expressing this in terms of the line bundle I called bare one. So remember, we also have this line bundle bare one. Well, I, I, I introduced it on the uh, smooth locus, but it kind of it can be defined in the same way on the entire locus, or it's the same as B of O. And so the second part of Mumford isomorphism is expressing this guy in terms of this in terms of fifth power of this guy. Okay, so. I think we need to take a five minute break now.
Right, so for those who missed the first part of the talk, I uh, explained how to Kadaira Spencer isomorphism leads to identification of the Berezinian of the modular space of super stable supercurves in terms of uh, in terms of the Berezinian of the push forward of a line bundle which I call omega x to the minus two, even though what is what is how it's really defined is you first take this omega x uh, to the minus two on the smooth locus and then you extend. And the claim is that it still extends as a line bundle. And yeah, so this is a little misleading. This is not really a, a, a power of a line bundle, but it's, it's a line bundle nevertheless. Um, and so th there is certain uh, Cartier divisor structure on the boundary you have to use here. And I'll maybe let me comment on that. And then the second part of Mumford isomorphism is, ex is expressing this line, Berezinian line bundle in terms of the power of the standard Berezinian line bundle obtained in terms of the Hodge bundle, the push forward of omega, or in terms of the trivial bundle. Right, so the, in the classical, yeah, so the, re the reason you need to define the uh, kind of local equations of the boundary here is because we have nilpotents. In the presence of nilpotents, the equations of divisors are not unique. You need to specify them. And so uh, recall that in the classical case of just uh, usual stable curves, you get the equation of the boundary kind of local okay, local equations <coughs> of the boundary divisor in uh, mg bar by looking at the complex uh, you have the natural map from you take relative relative differentials, this is a coherent shift flat over the base, into relative dualizing shift. And it's, it's an isomorphism on smooth locus, so you kind of take determinant of this push forward and there is an HL section there which gives you the equation. So for super curves, for stable super curves, you do similar thing, but uh, actually, this, well, I cannot do just exactly that because the ranks will be different. Here, this is generically rank one, and this is generically rank one. So for super curves, this will be generically rank one, one. So what I do instead is I consider omega xs goes to j lower star, j upper star, omega. Uh, okay, maybe I'll just write omega us. So u is a complement to the nodes. And then both of them are of the same rank, and it makes sense to consider Berezinian of this push forward, and there will be an HL section there which gives you the equation of boundary divisor. <coughs> now, the other thing that happens is that we have nodes of two types, and the boundary divisor can be split, uh, so we can uh, write the boundary divisor as the sum of two divisors. So one is going to be supported on the locus of Niveau Schwartz nodes, and the other will be supported on the locus of Ramon nodes. <coughs> and for this, you can do the following you can define uh, uh, it's kind of diff you can define this by by the ideal annihilator of push forward of the so you take co kernel of the structure derivation and then you take uh, 
push forward of that, and annihilator of this ideal gives you precisely Ramon node. So it turns out that, uh, precisely Neva Schwartz node. It turns out that near Ramon node, this is surjective, so this will, this will not contribute. Okay, and so uh, one can also prove that this uh, boundary divisor is a uh, normal crossing divisor. Normal crossing divisor, so it means that locally there ex near any point uh, there exists an etal ch chart where it's just given by uh, it's uh, some product of co some of the coordinates give you the equation of this divisor. Okay, let me now explain the second part of Mumford isomorphism. So I first exp explained it in the even case for usual families of stable curves. And then I'll explain what happens in the super case. So for the even case, there is uh, something called the lean symbol. So this is when you have uh, a family of super family of super curves of sorry of stable usual curves. So you have family of stable curves, and then uh, suppose you have two line bundles on, on the total space. So then with each, with each line bundle, we can consider uh, kind of uh, the determinant bundle construction. So this is going to be determinant of relative cohomology of this line bundle. Okay, so this this represent this is uh, always can be represented by some length one uh, complex, and then you just take determinant of the zeroth term, tensor it with inverse of determinant of the first term, and this does not depend up to canonical isomorphism does not depend on the representative and satisfies a lot of natural properties, but kind of the most intriguing one, which kind of can be viewed as categorification of certain piece of the riemann roch theorem for this push forward, is the following isomorphism due to the lean, that if you, th this kind of association of D, uh, to a D of L to a line bundle L behaves quadratically as a quadratic function. So if you take tensor product of two line bundles and apply this D construction to the tensor product, you can express it in terms of, so there's a canonical isomorphism, D of L1, tensor D of L2, tensor D of O inverse. And then there is a analog of bilinear form, which is called the lean symbol of L1 and L2. So, so this is a line bundle on, on the base. This is called the lean symbol, and it is uh, defined by choosing local bases of, uh, so, so whenever you have a local rat rational section of a line bundle, of each line bundle there is a canonical trivialization, and then there is a formula what happens when you change from one rational section to another, uh, given in terms of some determinants. So, you can express it in the following way. So, so it's is it? yes. Uh, if you have high, so this is this this is supposed to categorify the following notions. If you have two uh, divisor classes on the total space of a curve, you intersect them and push forward the intersection, you get something of code, so you push something co-dimension two in the total space and you get something of co-dimension one on the base. So if your space is not a curve, but more than a curve, then you need more line bundles. So if you have a surface, you need three line bundles. This was uh, considered by Elkic. 
Yes, yeah, so there is a generalization of this, but then it will be not pair of line bundles, but more of them. So, no, if, okay, maybe we should discuss later, yep. So, the definition is the following. So, if one of the, if you represent one of the line bundles, uh, in, yeah, so first of all, it, it has, by, it has natural bilinear, uh, structure. So if you, it's kind of bilinear in both arguments. And uh, so using this, it's uniquely determined by the following isomorphism that if you have some effective Cartier divisor in the re relative Cartier divisor, Uh, then this Delin symbol is a determinant. So you take, so you can, uh, when, when you restrict to, to the divisor, this is going to be a finite flat map. And so in particular, if you have a line bundle on D, it's push forward is going to be, let's, call, let's still call it pi, it's push forward is going to be a vector bundle on S. So I can take L restricted to D and push it forward, and I get one vector bundle, and I can take determinant of this. Or I can take trivial bundle on D and push it forward and take determinant of this and take inverse of this. So, so these two formulas uniquely, uniquely identify what is the Delin symbol. Um, and so then the claim is that you have this law for the determinant bundles. Now, in the super case, so the, you have the same story, but with important simplification, but L1, L2 is canonically trivial. So this is kind of one case where for a change, super case is easier than the even case. And the reason for this is the following, that if you have a divisor, so the reason is if you have any, for any pair of line bundles uh, and a divisor in C, if you consider, uh, if you consider Berezinian of pi star of L1 over D and Berezinian, okay, maybe I need a new board for this. <coughs> so if you consider Berezinian of pi star push forward of L1 over D, or Berezinian of pi star of L2 over D, then they're canonically isomorphism, canonically isomorphic. And the reason is that you choose any local isomorphism, local isomorphism between L1 and L2 over D. And then uh, the claim is that the induced isomorphism between these guys is going to be the same. And the reason if you change this isomorphism by some function f, uh, then, uh, then the isomorphism between Berezinians will change by Berezinian of, uh, of a matrix where, where you have kind of this, the, so this D has uh, kind of functions, when you have a, something of relative dimension zero one, then there is a kind of, there is constant function and there is one odd function. So, so you're if essentially taking, so this is something of rank one one. Yeah, and so, uh, so you'll have kind of Berezini of something like this, which is one because you take F divided by F. Uh, 
Uh, right, so now the Mumford isomorphism is obtained by using, right, so, uh, so, so if you have two even line bundles, so if L1 and L2 are uh, of rank one zero, then uh, we, we get kind of from this Deline symbol story, we get that B of L1 times L2 is isomorphic to B of L1, tensor B of, so B of L2, tensor B of O inverse. And uh, so, so some of our line bundles are going to be of rank zero one, so we need to remember the, the rule that when you change parity, Berezinian gets replaced by the inverse. So, so remember the task is to express, so we want to express Berezinian of the push forward of all x over s to the minus two in terms of bar one, which is B of O X or B of O. So the difficulty is that O X S is not a line bundle near Nivea Schwartz nodes. So, but uh, let's forget about Nivea Schwartz nodes for a second. So let's just do it on the sm for smooth curves or for curves which only have Ramon nodes. Then, uh, okay, so smooth case. Uh, this is obtained as follows. So you take first, uh, you apply, uh, okay, so I will use shorthand. I will stop writing X, S, so just to go through this quicker, so ser duality gives you uh, isomorphism of this with omega cubed. Then uh, omega cubed you write as uh, omega tensor omega squared, but in order to apply uh, this rule, I need to have two even line bundles, so I change parity and I put inverse here. So then I apply the rule and I get B of pi omega inverse tensor B of omega square inverse tensor B of O. So I only need to change parity once somewhere. So you can kind of put brackets like this. And then finally, uh, this turns out to be the same as this, so I get, so this is bare one and this is bare one, so I get B of omega square inverse tensor bare one. And then I apply it, uh, I apply the rule once, sorry, squared. And then I apply this rule once more, but now I apply it to express B of omega squared, so I can write B of omega squared inverse, so this is B of P omega tensor P omega, inverse, so I apply the, this rule once again, so these are both even, so P omega is going to be even line bundle, so it's B of P omega to the minus two, tensor B of O, and this is, so all of these are just bare one, so you get three copies of bare one. So combining this with, with this, we get that in the smooth case, we just get the fifth power of bare one, And the same is true if we don't have Nivea Schwartz nodes, only Ramon nodes. So, so uh, away from <coughs> delta and R and S, we get that B of O X S to the minus two is isomorphic to the bare one to the fifth. 
And the claim is that uh, if we want to include it, so, so theorem that, so over the entire SG bar, we have B of omega x s to the minus two is isomorphic to bar one to the fifth minus one, uh, one times the uh, divisor of an S node. So if we combine it with the previous uh, um, part with the part of, with Kodaira Spencer part, we get the Mumford isomorphism uh, of the following form on SG, SG bar that uh, the total, so the, the Berezinian of the SG bar, so the dualizing shift is isomorphic to bar one to the fifth. And remember, so we, we had this and then minus the entire delta and the delta is delta NS plus delta R. So we get twice delta NS and once delta R. Okay, so, uh, so this gives you kind of some information about uh, Mumford, kind of what happens with Mumford isomorphism on the boundaries. So it, it acquires, you can think, so we remember that in the, uh, in the definition of super measure, we used this uh, psi, which was a section of omega as g tensor bar one to the minus fifth. So this was uh, kind of an isomorph, this was a non nowhere vanishing section on this SG, on the smooth locus. But then the fact that we get these guys means that this psi acquires poles at the boundary. So it has poles of order two, of order two on delta N S and of order one on delta R. So you somehow have to deal, um, because we want to perform integration, we have somehow to regularize the integral to get rid of these divergences. And uh, so in genus two, we're able to do this using some special structure. So the kind of the most serious uh, divergence is of course this divergence of order two. So the, the divergence near Ramon node is not so serious because uh, there are extra logarithmic uh, factors coming from, from the super period map because Ramon node is necessarily uh, a non-separating node. So there is some so, so some periods should go to infinity logarithmically. So those extra factors kind of make the integral convergent near those, uh, uh, near those divisors. So the serious issue you have to deal with is this uh, uh, Schwartz uh, nodes. And now I will, so, but for this, it turns out that you need more information uh, kind of to, cancel the kind of the poles contributions. You need extra structure and kind of more information near delta and S. And let me explain how you can do this in genus two. Okay, so at least uh, some part of it. So now I will restrict. Okay, maybe before I restrict to genus two case, let me first of all explain that there is this clutching or gluing map. So I think in Arbarara Carnalba Griffiths, uh, this is called clutching map. So 
So this is uh, for usual modular spaces. Uh, if you take, uh, if you fix curves with with a, with one puncture, so you can glue them. You can kind of identify these punctures, and you'll get a st stable curve where these two punctures are glued into the node. <clears throat> so this is not, uh, yeah, so actually already at this level there is something you can uh, uh, compute and this can still be done for any genus. You can look at this kind of most polar part uh, of, uh, uh, of the Mumford isomorphism. Yeah, so there is a similar, so in the super case, there is a similar map. So you have to, you have to consider modular space with one uh, Neveo Schwartz puncture, which is just kind of the same thing that you Imagine it is just the usual uh, kind of re uh, section, kind of yeah. So just the usual puncture. So there is nothing special going on with the superconformal structure near this point. <clears throat> so one can check that superconformal structures glue into Neveu-Schwarz node uh, under this map. Kind of this is uh, Neveu-Schwarz. Puncture. So I haven't, I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but uh, um, this is just the same thing as module of supercurse with, with uh, uh, stable supercurse with uh, extra marked point which uh, should be away from the node. Right, but uh, yeah, already, already one can ask something for this map. Namely, one can take this uh, Mumford isomorphism and just restrict it to this boundary component and kind of analyze what happens uh, with this kind of most uh, polar part. And it turns out that uh, there is some splitting going on. So the, the kind of, th th this is an immersion and the normal bundle to this immersion can be expressed and it turns out that it splits. It's as something pulled back from the first factor and something pulled back from the second factor. And then it turns out that the polar part of Mumford isomorphism restricted to this product also factors as a product of Mumford isomorphisms for the lower, for the lower genus case. That's one important structure, but it's not enough. So it turns out that one need to analyze what happens in uh, infinitesimal neighborhood of the boundary. Okay, so we need to analyze uh, kind of uh, and formal neighborhood. Of the, of the boundary divisor of, the, of delta ns. <coughs> Yeah, and I actually only, only need this separated, yeah, we only need this, uh, I'll put it S here, this means that I'm only interested in this separated, separating node. Uh, yeah, and in fact, there is an even further restriction I need, so there are two components, so when you, when you glue two super curves into, uh, into one stable curve. So there are two cases. So the spin structures on these uh, components, they either both have to be even or they both have to be odd. So there are actually two components of this separating node in the Schwartz divisor. I only will need plus plus component. So somehow minus minus component is okay. So this means that I'm gluing two even, even, so there is an even spin structure here and an even spin structure here, and I glue them together into a Neveu Schwartz uh, node. Right, so uh, we need to describe this formal neighborhood. 
And uh, let me quickly explain uh, this for the for this uh, standard picture with the curves because already there it's not very well known. And then I always say that there is a similar structure with super curves where you just uh, kind of use the same type of data. So, so the idea is that you can, so there's a kind of, you can extend a gluing, this gluing map where you, at the same time, you, you, don't, you don't just glue, but you actually, de you can deform this node uh, kind of in a standard way, preserving kind of the curves away from the node. So if you, but for this, you need not only to choose the points here, you, only, you also need to choose some formal parameters near this point. So, so first of all, let me denote by mg uh, in kind of infinity here, uh, mg1 infinity. So this will be, a, so mg1, this is just a curve with one marked point. So here we also choose a formal parameter near this point. at P. So this is an infinite dimensional space, but it's, it's okay because it's, it's kind of, uh, so there is this group of changes of variables that kind of acts transitively in the fibers, so you can sort of control things along the fibers. As, as, uh, so basically this is always needed when you're doing some constructions which require choice of a formal parameter, and then you can check what happens when you change variables. Right, so then what I want to construct is uh, an extended gluing where I use here, uh, so on the first curve, I choose some formal parameter near P1. On the second curve, I choose some formal parameter near uh, P2. And then I, mm, I take here something like, uh, formal uh, spectrum of, uh, well, just spectrum, sorry, J just this uh, kind of uh, nilpotent uh, ring. So I can take C of T modulo T to some power. Okay, so if, if N equals one, then it will just be a point and it will reduce to this usual uh, construction. And then I still map it into MG1 plus G2 bar. So the idea is that kind of uh, you, so you use on the one hand, you use this, um, yeah, so, uh, so I need to explain, so if I have, if I have two, fam two, two families uh, like this, uh, two families of punctured curves over some ring R, how to glue them into a stable curve kind of over this base of C of T over T to the N. So I consider uh, the following thing. So we have some curves C1, C2 with punctures P1, P2 over ring R. This is commutative ring R. So basically what I want to do is I want to glue constant family we can glue a constant family over t uh, uh, so we just take c1 minus p1 disjoint union of C2 minus P2. And then we can glue it with a standard, uh, with standard uh, deformation of the node, which is given by, I don't know, Z1, Z2 equals uh, T, where T now can be any element of this ring R. So 
Yeah, so because I am, I'm doing this over uh, C of T to the T to the N, so I should think of this base as having some element T such that T to the N is zero. Right, and I also have this formal parameters Z1 and Z2 near P1 and P2. So it's possible to glue uh, this with the standard deformation because uh, we have the following. So if we, we kind of use the fact that we, we can uh, expand functions away from this point. Uh, yeah, actually we don't need the whole curve, we just pick some neighborhood and pick some neighborhood here. So then we can expand this in the formal parameter. So expand in formal parameter and we get into R of Z1. plus R of Z2. And on the other hand, on the other hand, we have this formal deformation of the node, which is this guy. So you have Z1, Z2 modular, the equation Z1, Z2 equals T. And there is also a kind of expansion map here, which is a little non-trivial, because uh, what you do is you send Uh, so if you, you send Z1 to Z1 comma T over Z2 and similarly you send Z2 to T over Z1 Z2 and so these, the, these substitutions make sense so be, because uh, even though you're supposed to take infinite series of Z1, Z2 the fact that T is nilpotent makes this formula as well defined. Yeah, and then you just uh, sort of define uh, fiber product of this and this, is, this gives you a ring and you can prove that this, this ring define, you, you glue it then with, uh, with C1 minus P1, C2 minus P2 and then you get kind of uh, deformation of the standard uh, gluing picture. So, and you get in this way, you get not just in the boundary divisor, but you get into some formal neighborhood of the boundary divisor. Okay, and so that's kind of important because this provides you, in, in a sense, what happens, it provides you with some formal coordinates near the separating node divisor. And then you can expand all the objects you want in terms of this uh, gluing coordinates. You can expand uh, Period, super period matrix, you can expand Mumford isomorphism, and this is indeed needed uh, in order to analyze the integrals. Okay, so let me explain what happens in the case when you glue together two curves of genus one. Yes? This is in all genus, yes, but the formulas for expansions are specific for genus two. Yeah, and also, okay, so I'll, I'll make also a leap and say that the same works in super case. So, so extended gluing also works in super case. So here you have, uh, so when, so you consider SG11 with uh, choice of parameter. So this is, so now, formal parameter on a super curve is not just one coordinate, it's two coordinates, z and theta, and they should be super conformal coordinates. So this is a choice of super, conform of super conformal parameter, z theta near a puncture. And so you get this times this goes into, uh, well, times uh, formal spectrum of, uh, so sorry, times the spectrum of C of T over T to the N. This goes into formal neighborhood of the boundary divisor of delta N S plus, uh, sorry, uh, S in S G1 plus G2 bar. So what, what is special in G, uh, so 
we're interested in the case when G1 equals G2 equals 1. What is special in this case? So what is special is that any, uh, any genus 1 curve has a canonical, so there is really a canonical choice of a parameter if you fix a tangent vector. You just need only to fix kind of one jet of a parameter and then it has a canonical extension. Okay, so every, so if, if C P is of stable of genus 1, So then we can, we, we, have a, we have a kind of particular choices of parameters. We have a kind of good, good choice of a parameter z near p. So only consider formal parameters z near p such that when you consider dz, this comes from a global, extends to a global section of the, to a global section. of uh, omega c. Okay, and this means that there is a canonical choice of a parameter up to rescaling. Okay, so this canonical choice of parameter up to rescaling, and rescaling you can deal with a formal parameter up to rescaling. And uh, in the same way, in the super case, there is a canonical choice uh, of conformal, of super conformal parameters also up to rescaling on the super curve of genus one with Niver Schwartz puncture. Okay, so, and it means, so, in a, neighbor, in a formal neighborhood, neighborhood of, of uh, delta and S separating node plus plus inside S2 bar, so this is genus two. So this, this is a divisor where we glue together two uh, elliptic curves. And in each of them, we choose even spin structure. So we have coordinates, gluing coordinates, which have, uh, uh, so which have form uh, tau one, tau two, t at one, at two. Okay, so they defined up to some risk. Okay, so yeah, I will kind of skip the rescaling story part. So this tau one, this is kind of parameter defining parameter of one elliptic curve. This tau two corresponds to the second elliptic curve. T, T is the gluing parameter, so the one I used over there. And theta one and theta two are extra odd variables, which you also can just think of as being free variables. And you can expand uh, things in terms of these parameters. For example, super period, yeah, so we can expand on these parameters and uh, in these coordinates. So for example, we get that uh, period matrix will look like this, so it's two by two, right? It's genus two, so it's two by two symmetric matrix. It will look like tau one, tau two on diagonal, not surprisingly, and something like this here. This is modular T cube. Um, so this actually uh, gives you some information about the canonical projection. So for genus two, the modular space uh, of smooth supercurves has a canonical projection. It tells you a little bit what, how it behaves uh, near the boundary. 
And, but the most crucial uh, formula is uh, how, what happens with the Mumford isomorphism near the boundary. So you expand Mumford isomorphism near the boundary and you get, uh, you get some formulas for it kind of in, in terms of these coordinates. So then here you have some canonical, so S is some trivialization of the line bundle bear one to the bear one. And then there is a kind of canonical trivialization of the Berezinian top form. And uh, so here, this guy, uh, psi naught, so there is some, something depending on tau one and tau two, and in fact, it splits in appropriate sense. And there is no term with one over two here, and uh, psi, psi one has pole of order one only. And uh, this gives you some information about superstring measure. So, so you get some information about about mu, and then I would need maybe another couple of lectures to explain how you regularize the integral and how you use this information to do pole cancellation. But one crucial point is that this constant here it is expressed in terms of genus one Mumford isomorphism and uh, kind of following Witten, you can write explicit formula for genus one Mumford isomorphism and the crucial, in, crucial uh, statement there is that this uh, modular space of genus one curves, it splits so you can think of things as living on bosonic space which is just triple covering of the usual modular space of genus one so this curves and if you sum over this uh, fibers of this triple covering, you get zero. So this is somehow important for the cancellation of the poles of the second order. Okay, I think this is all I wanted to say. Sorry, could you say a little louder? Yeah, what exactly is this uh, super Mumford isomorphism? So psi is the, uh, what I, so this is uh, a section of bare one to the minus fifth tensor omega s. And, uh, and so it has a, so as I explained, it has a pole of order two near Niver Schwartz divisor. And here I kind, of, I kind of make this more explicit where, in which term this pole appears. So you can expand it, it's an even section. So you can expand it in terms of these coordinates. This is purely holomorphic data, right? You can expand it in terms of these coordinates. So there will be t this is a term without uh, odd variables. This is a term with odd variables. So the term without odd variables will indeed have this second order pole. And you can say more about the splitting of the numerator uh, when we restrict it to the boundary. And psi one is, uh, is only has order one pole. Over what? Yeah, yeah, but this twisting, this is exactly the fact that you have poles. Right, so, so to say that, uh, so the twisting by two delta n s means that this has all pole of order two. I'm now leaving away from Ramon divisor, so I don't see Ramon, Ramon thing here, yeah. They don't make sense because you don't have canonical parameters. I'm using here very, I, I, I use here very uh, 
crucially that for genus one curves, you have a canonical parameters up to rescaling. Oh, yeah, yeah. So there is a formula on the bound when you restrict to the boundary, but it's not enough. I need to know something about psi in the second neighborhood of the boundary. Just restricting it to the boundary is okay. That, that information I know. The, more, the information about the most polar part um, kind of be, being of certain form in terms of lower genus information, that I know for any genus. But I need some further information. For example, I need the fact that there is no term with 1 over t here. That depends on specific choice of coordinates, which I don't uh, expect to have in higher genus. Hmm? The basic question, what is omega of SG bar, I answered before. Yeah. In all genus, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, but, but that, that is not enough information to, to integrate. Yeah.